Schliemann brought Troy back to light. Spyridon Marinatos Akrotiri Much like Schliemann, Marinatos's energy, perseverance, and meticulousness in this endeavor was based on a daring archaeological hypothesis. He assumed that the volcanic cataclysm of Santorini had led to the downfall of Minoan civilization and culture, and that this catastrophe was reflected in Plato's Atlantis narrative. He fared similarly to Schliemann. He made great discoveries, but his basic assumption did not prove he true. Fifty-five years have passed since the first systematic archaeological excavations at Akrotiri. The city that emerged from under the pumice layers has given us fascinating insights into Cycladic culture. Above all, the frescoes preserve the social and economic life of an era whose written documents we still cannot read. This video presents the new scientific research and the questions that are still unanswered. It deals with the key points. Was the Cycladic culture part of a Minoan advanced civilization? What were the power structures and everyday life like? Did the inhabitants of Akrotiri have any inkling of the dangers threatening them from the volcano? When did the Great Cataclysm take place, and what effects did it have on Akrotiri and the entire Cycladic and Minoan culture? The concept of advanced civilization, Hochkultur in German, is disputed today. That notwithstanding, the classic characteristics of an advanced civilization are that agriculture is no longer purely subsistence farming and metalworking is done. Even more important is the existence of a network of cities characterized by social differentiation and a ruling class. A prerequisite for the formation of these complex social systems is that the culture has a script. These characteristics all apply to the Minoan and Cycladic cultures, but they also point to a major problem. Linear A, the Minoan script, has not yet been deciphered, and unless a great coincidence comes to the rescue, this will stay the case. Since only a few tablets have been found in Linear A, it will hardly be possible to draw conclusions from the deciphered Linear B script, which is based on Greek. The current interpretation as a script that primarily served economic relations must also be questioned. Why then have so few documents been found? This points more to cultic symbols and not to business letters. This makes the wall paintings in Akrotiri all the more important. Their meticulous reconstruction, often supported by additions, has brought Minoan Cycladic culture back to life in a unique way. They give us information about the clothing, houses, jewelry, and activities of the people who lived in Akrotiri before the Great Cataclysm. Formerly replicas of the frescoes were on display in a separate museum building, the Nomikos Convention Center. For some years now, they have been on display directly in the basement of Fira's prehistoric museum, where they are impressively presented. As admirable as the frescoes are, some central questions cannot be answered by studying them. Were there overlapping political structures in Crete and the Cyclades, or only social, economic, and cultural connections? Thucydides and other ancient historians use the term thalassocracy to describe Minoan domination over a larger maritime area. But what is meant by it remains controversial among contemporary scholars. Theology. 
gist is the biggest in the world that happened here, okay? And this huge eruption happened about, I can't tell you when exactly, sorry for this, the geologists, they have different theories. Akrotiri, the Minoan Pompeii, lies to the southeast of Thera, the main island of the Santorini archipelago. Thera comprises about half of the walls of the volcanic caldera that forms this archipelago. The other remnants are the island of Therasia and the large rock Aspronisi. In addition, new islands of volcanic material have formed in the interior of the caldera since the Minoan cataclysm. Currently, these are Nea and Palia Kameni. The first geological reconstruction attempts had seen the island shape in Minoan times as a stratovolcano protruding above sea level, comparable to today's Stromboli. However, stromatolites, sedimentary rocks formed in the sea, were found that had been ejected in the course of the Minoan cataclysm. Therefore, this view was no longer tenable. Instead, part of the caldera must have been filled with seawater in Minoan times. Geologists still argue about the exact shape of the Santorini archipelago before the Great Cataclysm. What is certain is that the rim of the crater that protruded from the sea was much narrower. The area of today's airport was below sea level, only the rock of Monolithos protruded. On the other hand, the interior of the caldera consisted largely of volcanic rock and was solid land. Recent research postulates that the only access to the interior of the caldera lay between Oya and Therasia. The extent to which speculative assumptions support each other, only to collapse like a house of cards, is particularly evident in the case of the famous fleet fresco from Akrotiri. This is part of a miniature frieze that decorated the upper part of the four walls of a room on the third floor of the so called West House. The West House was not very large, but fulfilled representative functions in its upper rooms, since this upper room was abundantly equipped with windows and doors on all four sides. Only a few representations could be accommodated in the central area. From there, for example, come the frescoes of the two standing, unclothed men with bundles of fish in their hands. As well as, from the door area, a female figure, usually interpreted as a priestess. The posture and largely shaven head speak for this. Only in the upper area of the four walls was it possible to execute a fresco running around the room. There we find the fleet miniature frieze. Christos Dumas called it as the oldest surviving European nautical chart. Whether all four sides of the miniature frieze represent a uniform theme is still under discussion. Almost nothing has survived from the west wall, and only a relatively small piece from the north wall. In the upper section, it shows a town, the drive of a herd of cattle, and a group marching armed with spears and shields. The lower section of the painting obviously depicts a sea battle. Several unclothed bodies float in the sea. A good half of the miniature frieze on the east wall, about two meters, has survived. It shows an exotic river landscape. Various wild animals as well as a griffin are on the river banks. That, as Dumas claims, this fresco shows a landscape in the flotilla's itinerary is speculation. Only the fresco on the south wall is almost completely preserved. It is four meters wide and just under half a meter high and shows a festively decorated flotilla apparently traveling in parade formation between two towns. In the middle of its journey, it crosses a stretch of open sea because no land is visible in the background. This is certainly not a flotilla on a war mission or on a reconnaissance trip. Of course, the ships could be returning from such a mission. 
attempts at interpretation recognize the city to which the flotilla is on its way as Akrotiri or the nearby Bylos Harbor. They further assume that the flotilla is sailing within the caldera. Differences exist regarding the city from which the flotilla departs. Among others, it is located on Therasia and below Megalovuno. Most researchers emphasize that the flotilla sails within the caldera. This should also explain the view of the open sea, similar to the one we have today between Therasia and Aspernisi. Other authors, however, see this only as a stylistic device. These attempts at interpretation fundamentally contradict the latest reconstructions of Santorini before the Great Cataclysm. According to these, the opening to the open sea was not near Aspernisi, but between Oya and Theresia. Moreover, Akrotiri did not have a harbor in the caldera at all, as the southern area of the caldera was above sea level. In interpreting the fleet's journey, our inadequate knowledge of Minoan and Cycletic culture becomes very clear. How realistic were the representations of the time, and did they represent real events at all? Perhaps the fleet sailed before the Cycladic Minoan Atlantis. The excavation site of Akrotiri is located in the southeast of Thera. The ruins are located in a shallow depression about 250 meters from the Red Beach. In Minoan times, Akrotiri had a harbor facing the open sea. Earlier research assumed a second main harbor in the caldera, near Balos. According to the latest reconstruction attempts of the caldera before the Great Cataclysm, this is not very likely. As early as the 19th century, archaeological chance finds were made in the area of Akrotiri, but it was only under Spiridon Marinatos that systematic excavations began. The first groundbreaking was on May 25, 1967. Marinatos died in an accident during the excavations in 1974. His grave is on the edge of the present site, and the excavation was continued by his student Christos Dumas. The excavation site was not open to the public for about 10 years after the turn of the millennium. The time was needed to erect a new roof over the excavations. The ancient Minoans would certainly have managed it in less time. Since the foundations of the buildings are several meters deep, the entire settlement is now covered by a large flat roof cleverly imitating a wave pattern. The age, Whether the shelter age, built by a green architect really has so the hoped-for bioclimatic benefits is doubtful. The site on which the city of Akrotiri was built was already inhabited in the Neolithic period, around 5000 BC. Shards of several predecessor settlements have been found there. The city of Akrotiri developed on the rubble heaps of these settlements from 2100 BC, i.e., in the Middle Cycladic period. Archaeologists assume that the excavation site, with an area of about 100 acres and 10 buildings, represents only a small part of this Cycladic trading city. This assumption is speculative, however, as investigations with ground-penetrating radar in the case of the surroundings of Akrotiri west, did not yield north, any usable results. So this was like this, okay? The, the, the okay, windows so are that here. was... The volcanic deposits with the embedded rock debris prevent this. Only further excavations can clarify whether 1,000 or 8,000 people lived in Akrotiri. The same applies to the question whether most of the inhabitants were able to escape the main cataclysm by taking flight. This was originally assumed of the inhabitants of Herculaneum too, before 300 skeletons were found under the volcanic ash in the harbor. Not much is known about other Minoan settlements on Santorini either. Only in a few places have debris of Minoan Cycladic buildings been excavated, 
such as at the southern tip of present-day Therasia, near the abandoned monastery of Moni Kimisi Theotoku. Wherever American universities are not conducting archaeological campaigns, or Yevgeny Kaspersky, is providing large sums of money for excavations, the Greek administration is indulging in its favorite project, doing nothing. Although much of Akrotiri still awaits discovery, most scholars assume that it was a city of wealthy merchants and seamen, not a city of royal palaces and nobles. The latter ruled on Crete, but did not exercise any direct power on Thera. The formerly prevailing theory that Akrotiri was a colony of the Minoans is now considered to be disproved, also on the basis of the excavation findings. Most researchers also rule out direct control over religious institutions. The differences between Cretan and Cycladic culture are too significant for that. Today, leading researchers speak of a Versailles effect, i.e. an imprint of the Aegean Kwan by the style and culture of Minoan Crete, which, however, allowed many deviations. The conical cups typical of this cultural area, the paper cups of early Aegean history, were not only produced on Crete, but also on the Cycladic islands. The same applies to the seals, which show many cultural and artistic similarities with those on Crete, but which clearly speak for an independent Cycladic administration and organization. Whether these seals, by their depiction of the popular Minoan bull jump, suggest a kind of supremacy of Crete is uncertain. Texts in Linear A script have also been found on pottery sherds at Akrotiri. As with the seals, it can be assumed that they were produced by Autochthonous Thorean scribes, especially for recording trade goods. The so-called Cretan hieroglyphs, which precede the Linear A script on Crete, have not yet been found in the Cyclades. Many houses in Akrotiri are large, have three stories, and, absolutely unusual for the Bronze Age, have a connection to a sewage system. The rich decoration with frescoes, which in Crete are found almost only in palaces, indicates the wealth of the house owners. In the part of the city excavated so far, three different types of houses are found, which also have different functions, the mansions called Cheste by Marinatos, the large detached buildings and the blocks of buildings. Part of Akrotiri's prosperity was based on the weaving and pottery industry. Another was based on the overland and sea routes that made Akrotiri or Santorini the hub of trade flows between Asia Minor, Mesopotamia, the Minoan Cycladic coin, and Greece. The oldest evidence of settlement found in Akrotiri dates back to the 5th millennium BC. This small peninsula to the southeast of Thera was therefore already inhabited at the beginning of the late Neolithic, and certainly also had a natural harbor. The current state of research does not allow us to reliably say exactly where the coastline ran. Akrotiri was badly affected by severe earthquakes at least twice before the Great Cataclysm. The city is built, as it were, on the ruins of its predecessor settlements, including their cemeteries, and is partly integrated into them. The lowest floor of the houses is often a kind of basement, buried for the most part in the rubble of the predecessor settlements. In these rubble masses, not only building material and pottery shards from the earlier settlements were found, but even small fragments of frescoes from an older settlement layer. Otherwise, all the frescoes are certainly from the late Cycladic period. They were painted between about 2000 BC, when a severe earthquake largely destroyed Akrotiri, 
and the rebuilding of the city, which then perished in the Thera Cataclysm. Whether the fresco technique represents an autonomous development of the Thoraeans or Minoans, or whether it was imported from the Near East, or Egypt is still being discussed. If it is an import, it is quite possible that the art technique first reached the Cyclades, and then Crete. The frescoes are predominantly wall paintings that were applied directly to a still wet surface, usually in several layers. Their high quality and lively execution shows that they originate from a longer artistic development and tradition, but also their integration into the buildings which takes into account the premises and the viewer in the fresco composition, testifies to the skill of the artists. Unlike Pompeii, where the volcanic ash rain enclosed and preserved the Roman frescoes in their original state, most of the frescoes in Akrotiri lay as pieces of rubble on the floor or in front of the walls they once adorned. There are very few exceptions to this, such as the young man carrying fishes, a fresco in the same room as the fleet fresco. It was almost completely preserved in Ist original composition. Since we can neither read the Minoan Linear A script nor the Minoan Hieroglyphic script, the frescoes are the most meaningful symbols and accounts of Minoan and Cycladic culture. They are the most important contemporary evidence we rely on to learn about the political, cultural and religious environment in Europe's first advanced civilization. For example, there has long been speculation about why the blue monkeys are depicted so vividly on several frescoes. Not about the unusual blue color of the monkeys. Monkeys with blue hair or blue fur do not exist in nature. But this blue color, analogous to the blue backs of the heads of the shaven-headed young women and men, depicted on various frescoes, probably represents the color gray. This color did not exist in the color palette of the fresco artists, it was substituted by blue. On the so-called monkey fresco in Akrotiri and Knossos, the monkeys are depicted particularly naturally and in many different poses. For this representation, the Cycladic artist would have had to see the monkeys, if possible even in their natural environment. Could it be that the animals had been imported to the Cyclades? For a while, it was even suspected that the skull of such a monkey had been found near Akrotiri. But this proved to be a hasty conclusion. Later it was confirmed that it was only an unusually shaped stone. Had the Cycladic artists perhaps adopted ancient Egyptian monkey representations of the god Thoth? The scientific examination of the monkey fresco by a biologist brought completely new aspects. He pointed out that the monkeys depicted were not African baboons or guenons, but Indian Hanuman langurs. In that case, the models for the monkey depictions would not have come from Egypt, but via Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. This fits quite seamlessly into the hypothesis that Santorini was the hub between the Asia Minor advanced civilizations and Crete. However, in this case, it is unlikely that the Cycladic artists used living monkeys as models. The fact that the figures in the frescoes often have shaven heads, recognizable by the blue backs of their heads, indicates that the majority of the frescoes can be assigned to cultic or religious themes. There are further indications of this. For example, in one fresco behind the woman, probably a nature goddess, who is sitting on a throne chair, there is a griffin. It is also clear from many of the actions depicted, such as the picking of crocuses, that ritual rather than agricultural activities are meant. In many cases, the young women are wearing an unusual form of flounce skirt. Since younger and older women are sometimes juxtaposed, it is certainly justified to assume that initiation rites are being depicted here. However, these are only very global statements. Thus, a few figures on the flotilla fresco also seem to have blue, i.e. shaved, heads. 
and not only in the city from which the fleet departs, but also on board of ships. This contradicts the view that Blueback's oft he had stand for ritual baldness. Maybe it was just a special haircut after all. And we are entering a web of supposedly mutually supporting misstatements. It's as if, in a distant future, viewers researching contemporary photos would look for the many wild animals which are responsible for all the torn trousers. Akrotiri, the city of seafarers and traders, with its frescoes and riches, perished in the Thera Cataclysm, and yet has been also uniquely preserved by it for posterity. The devastating eruption occurred on the tectonic boundary between Europe and Africa. About 200 kilometers south of Santorini, the African plate slides under the European plate, more precisely the Aegean microplate. In this subduction zone, magma rises in the area of the Cycladic Arc. In addition to Santorini, Methana, Milos, and Niceros are also located there. The volcanism that formed the caldera of Santorini began about one million years ago, and reached its final peak in the Minoan eruption about 3,600 years ago. The date, extent, and effects of this cataclysm are still very controversial among the leading researchers. The research of the last 30 years, which is based on scientific methods, dates the Minoan Cataclysm fairly consistently to the period between 1630 and 1600 BC. Egyptologists place it a good 100 years later. But, there are considerable problems with both dates. The ash deposited in ice cores, dated to 1627 BC, comes from the Aniakchak II volcano in Alaska, according to recent research. The dating of olive tree branches buried under the volcanic ash using the radiocarbon method is also considered not entirely reliable. With their help, the eruption was dated to 1613 BC. The same applies to the determination with the help of tree rings from trees. Recent studies show that in certain years the formation of tree rings is completely absent. Recently, Hopes have therefore been placed on dating with the help of the thermoluminescence method and the rehydroxylation method in ceramic dating. This high chronology dating is opposed both by the calculations of Egyptologists and by completely new dendrological investigations. The Egyptologists evaluate the information in certain Egyptian sources as statements that point to the long-distance effects of the Minoan explosion, and, on the basis of the Egyptian ruler lists, date the eruption to the time around 1500 BC. However, whether these sources really refer to the consequences of a volcanic eruption is more than doubtful. Investigations of the volcanic ash deposits, for example, show that it was transported mainly to the east, in the direction of Asia Minor. Egypt was only marginally affected. This makes the attribution of the ancient Egyptian texts even more improbable. Using a similar methodology, Santorini is classified as the legendary Atlantis, or the Ten Plagues before the Exodus are seen as pictorial descriptions of a weather and climate a catastrophe caused by the volcanic eruption of Santorini. These are speculations and esoteric wishful thinking. Those statements have little to do with scientific research and methodology. The situation is different when it comes to age determination based on dendrological characteristics. In recent years, these have been increasingly refined and linked with other dating methods. Nevertheless, the leading specialist in this field, Charlotte Pearson at the University of Arizona, 
has so far only been able to narrow down the cataclysm to three possible dates. 1611 BC, 1562 to 1555 BC, or 1538 BC. Basically, this brings us back to the range that scientists were arguing about 30 years ago. However, research into the actual course of the volcanic eruption has painted a new picture in recent years. The Vulcan Explosion Index is no longer estimated at 7, but at 5 or 6 based on new estimates of the ejecta masses. According to this, the Thera volcano ejected about 14 million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere, only a third of the ejection caused by the Aniakchak II volcano in Alaska. Tambora's sulfur emissions were also twice as large. Earthquakes and phreatomagmatic activity heralded the Great Thera Cataclysm. The earthquakes caused considerable damage to the buildings of Akrotiri, and the phreatomagmatic explosion deposited a 3 to 8 Sineptor thick layer of pumice. However, cleanup activities e.g. beds were stacked in the street in front of the buildings, show that residents returned after the earthquakes. When the freedom magmatic eruptions began, they fled, taking their valuables with them. With the exception of a 10 centimeter golden ibex statue in Zesty III, almost no valuable artifacts were found during the excavations, and no human skeletons either. The current hypothesis is that the inhabitants were able to leave the island in time after the onset of the Frieto magmatic explosions and took their valuables with them. Recent reconstructions of the Santorini archipelago in Minoan times show that before the Great Cataclysm, only a small part in the north consisted of a shallow sea bay or even a lagoon closed off from the sea. This occupied only a small area and was the remnant of a caldera formed during an eruption 18,000 years ago, the so-called Cape Riva eruption. The shallow waters of this lagoon also contained the stromatolites found later in volcanic deposits. The first phase of the Minoan eruption was of the Plinian type. It took place in the immediate vicinity of the lagoon located in the north of Santorini. It was driven by the gas accumulated in the volcanic vent and its eruption column reached into the stratosphere. In Akrotiri, a 120 centimeter thick layer of pumice was deposited. In Fira, this layer was up to six meters high. In the second and third phase, the vent moved into the lagoon and phreatomagmatic explosions occurred. This is where the more recent investigations see a decisive difference to the ideas about the cataclysm that prevailed at the turn of the millennium and were represented by Friedrichs and Buyukalakis, for example. They assumed that large amounts of seawater entered the vent during the later phases and led to particularly violent and explosive eruptions. According to the more recent simulations, the eruptions in the Plinian phase evaporated the water of the lagoon and piled up a massive tuff cone. It completely sealed off the interior of the caldera from the surrounding sea. Thus, the entire caldera, including the area that today lies within the caldera walls, was solid land. And thus, the idea that in this phase, or in the subsequent fourth phase, a massive tsunami tidal wave was caused by the collapse of the magma chamber and, as a consequence, seawater entering it is invalid. Since the two most violent explosion phases occurred on land and no direct penetration of seawater into the volcanic vent was possible, a reassessment of explosion strength and regional or global consequences had to be made. Pyroclastic flows, as well as submarine landslides, were now seen as the main triggers for the tsunami caused by the Minoan cataclysm. 
However, these cannot have had as devastating an impact as direct flooding of the volcanic vent by seawater. The fact that in 2022, the first human being was allegedly found to have died as a result of the effects of the tsunami wave, during excavations in Chesme, a western Turkish coastal town, certainly requires further verification. So shortly after the devastating cataclysm, the Santorini archipelago looked completely different from today. The entire caldera area was dry land, the caldera wall prevented the sea from filling the inner area of the crater, even where it was partially below sea level, after collapse of the magma chamber. However, this condition was unstable, because erosion immediately began to gnaw away at the caldera barrier due to the strong water pressure. The first breakthrough, as indicated by studies of the seabed, was in the northwest, between today's Oya and the island of Theresia. If the caldera wall was breached at one point, the caldera interior was filled with seawater relatively quickly. Simulations assume a maximum of two days. Only some time later did the two other breakthroughs occur in the southwest, between Theresia and Aspernisi, and between Aspernisi and the southern tip of Thera. Investigations of the seabed suggest that in this case there was no strong current towards the crater basin. The reason is the inner basin was already flooded with seawater. With a reassessment of the VEI, the short-term and long-term consequences of the Thera cataclysm must also be reassessed. The most important short-term consequence is undoubtedly the tsunami. A number of field studies are currently underway on its strength and impact in the eastern Mediterranean. We will have to wait for the concrete results. Regarding the long-term consequences, there are two problem areas. The question of whether there were significant climatic changes and whether there is a connection between the Thera cataclysm and the decline of the Minoan culture. In answering both questions, it is not only the strength of the cataclysm that plays a role, but above all, complex feedbacks. With the current state of knowledge, all answers are highly speculative. Overall, it shows that our knowledge about the exact course of the Minoan cataclysm and its consequences is still very incomplete. Further research would be urgently needed to arrive at assured and universally accepted results that stand up to scientific criteria. The unbearable snail's pace that those responsible for the excavations at Akrotiri are showing, however, gives little hope. Perhaps, for new findings, one has to rely more on archaeological research in Turkey and Israel than in Greece. Santorini is not Atlantis, but Akrotiri, like Lascaux or Lepenskivir, is one of the formative places of Europe. Exploring and understanding this beginning could truly be pursued with a little more verve.